The Olivet Discourse warns of a time of impending trouble for the Jewish nation. Within it is one of those maddening prophecies that have both near and far fulfillments in mind. Luke records it like this. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, let those who are in the midst of her depart, and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Luke 21 20 through 24. In the light of events that transpired less than a generation after these words were spoken, it is obvious that the near fulfillment was to be found in the sack of Jerusalem by the Romans under Titus in 70 AD. The war raged for years and began in 67, before the siege began. There was plenty of time to escape, and thousands of Christians who lived in the city, knowing the prophecy, did precisely that. But non-Christian Jews, neither knowing nor believing the words of the slain rabbi, holed up in Jerusalem and died, or were enslaved, dispersed to the farthest corners of the empire. End of story? Not by a long shot. Yahshua apparently kept talking, throwing a different light on things. There was more to this than just Romans. Matthew and Mark both recorded more of the story. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down into the house, nor enter to take anything out of his house, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant, and those who are nursing babies in those days, and pray that your flight not be in winter, for in those days there will be tribulation, such has not been seen since the beginning of the creation, which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. Although similar in tone, this admonition clearly speaks of something more intense, more sudden than the siege of Jerusalem. The signal to flee has changed from when Jerusalem is surrounded by armies to when you see the abomination of desolation. The times he is speaking of now are said to have no parallel in history, past or future. That means worse than Assyria, worse than Babylon, worse even than Hitler's Holocaust, where half of the world's Jewish population was annihilated. And was Yahshua talking only about Jews or the whole race of mankind? Here's the really bad news. Mark goes on to say... Unless the Master had shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he chose, he shortened the days. If anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. Mark 13, 14 through 23. See also Matthew 24, 25 and 26. The most successful false Christ of all, of course, will be the Antichrist. But there will apparently be many others all doing things that defy logic and prove their divine status. But beyond that, unnatural death during this time will be so common, the human race, over six billion strong as I write these words, will actually become an endangered species. What we've seen in our study up to this point, over 1.5 billion souls dead due to the Gog-Magog war, is merely a warm-up act. <laughs> Thank you.
Nowhere in Scripture is a nice, clean, tribulation timetable given to us, but it's possible to piece the clues together from hints scattered throughout the prophetic record. It seems that a great deal is happening at our present juncture, at or near the midpoint of the tribulation, so perhaps it would be helpful to do a quick review of the passages that tell us the timing of these days, if for no other reason to remind you that I'm not just making this stuff up as I go along. If you'll recall, the time structure of the tribulation is laid out plainly in Daniel. Seventy weeks. Literally sevens, that is, seven-year periods, are determined for your people and for your set-apart city. Sixty-nine of these seventy-seven-year units have already passed, coming to a close on the day Yahshua made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, less than a week before his crucifixion. This leaves one week left to go, seven years in which to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most set apart. Daniel 9.24 This last seven-year span of time starts with a treaty. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Daniel 9:27. Here we see that three and a half years into the seven-year covenant, the willful prince, that is the Antichrist, will stop the Jewish sacrificial service that's been going on in the rebuilt temple, since it can't, by Levitical law, be performed in any other place, and set himself up as God in their stead. This time the treachery of the broken treaty is couched in poetic terms, no less sinister for their eloquence. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. In other words, this man will employ the most detestable sort of idolatry, that of Satan worship, as he sets out to destroy mankind. This is the same event of which Paul warned us. The man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 and 4. Daniel also gives us a recap of the three and a half years following this pivotal episode. I was watching, and the same horn, the Antichrist, was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days, that's Yahshua, came, and a judgment was made in favor of the set apart of the Most High. And the time came for the set apart to possess the kingdom. He, again the Antichrist, shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the set apart of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the set apart shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. Daniel 7, 21 and 22, also 25. A time, in this context, is a prophetic year, 360 days. So he's saying the saints, the Hebrew Kaddish, the holy ones, the set-apart ones, are going to be pummeled for three and a half years until the coming of the Messiah. The Jewish believers are in view in this case, but we realize from Revelation 12:17 that the new Gentile Christians are in for it as well. We know that the lunisolar prophetic year of 360 days is being used in these predictions because the first 69 weeks were fulfilled precisely to the very day using this system. 69 times 7 times 360 equals 173,880 days from the prophetically revealed starting point. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and reread chapter 7. In the passages we've just reviewed, time spans are spoken of in rather generalized terms, in weeks, or sevens, times, and years. 
But there are several passages that pin things down more tightly, to months or even days. First, let's look at the clues about the timing that precede the abomination of desolation. Ezekiel writes of a seven-month period of time when Israel will be mopping up from the devastation of the Gog-Magog War. They will bury Gog and all his multitude. Therefore they will call it the Valley of Heman Gog. For seven months the house of Yisrael will be burying them in order to cleanse the land. Indeed, all the people of the land will be burying, and they will gain renown for it on the day that I, this would be Yahweh, am glorified. Ezekiel 39, 11-13 Here we see that for seven months, practically everybody in the country is occupied in cleaning up the country, disposing of the dead bodies, but also presumably gathering up and stashing the leftover war material and supplies the Muslims brought in with them. Nobody is seen running for their lives, which leads us to the inescapable conclusion that there is at least a seven-month gap, perhaps much longer, between the end of World War III or at least the Gog-Magog phase of it within Israel, and the abomination of desolation. Second, when John in his vision was given a reed and told to measure the temple of God, he was instructed to ignore the outer court, because they, this would be the Gentiles, will tread the set-apart city underfoot for forty-two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy one thousand two hundred and sixty days, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation eleven two and 3. Forty-two months and one thousand two hundred and sixty days are the same length of time, half of the tribulation's seven three hundred and sixty day years. In other words, three and a half years. We'll talk about these two witnesses in a future chapter, but for now, consider the length of their prophetic ministry, exactly 1,260 days. Note that although they're exactly the same duration, we aren't specifically told that the 42 months and the 1,260 days are coterminous. Indeed, the fact that the two identical time spans are expressed in two different ways might be a clue that they aren't precise. Precisely the same 1,260 days.